does weather affect repetitive strain? One of our viewers asked, so here we have to answer this question, our chief medical expert, Dr. Robert Markison. Hello, Dr. Markison, welcome back. Hi, thanks. Always glad to be with the weather affecting RSI. The three primary variables of weather are temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, all three can interact. And remember from calculus, it's about velocity, acceleration, deceleration. So it's not only the absolute values of temperature, barometer, barometric pressure, humidity, it's the rate of change. And when things are changing rapidly in terms of those variables, you can negatively impact RSI. The most obvious is temperature because environmental cold exposure is going to negatively impact inflow and outflow microcirculation. And so, so a sudden downshift in temperature, if it's suddenly cooling, then you're gonna be cold exposed. You're gonna have less nutrient blood flow, cell delivery and waste washout so that you won't handle repetition well. Barometric pressure often negatively impacts the joints. And so those with quote rheumatiz uh, know what the weather is gonna be like because they feel it in their joints. The partial pressure in physics terms of what's happening in a joint is very responsive to barometric pressure. So suddenly sh sudden shifts to high pressure can definitely negatively impact joints whether or not you have osteoarthritis, but obviously those sufferers with intrinsic joint pathology, osteoarthritis, gout, and so on, will negatively be negatively affected by that. And humidity is a bit uncertain. The main thing is that you can dry out. So if you're in a terribly dry climate, uh, then you're dehydrating rapidly, which means your microcirculation, your total blood volume is less, and certainly you wanna keep the core organs moist. You wanna have the brain, plenty of flow, coronary arteries to the heart, plenty of flow, guts, adequate flow, all at the expense of the limbs, which become kind of dried out aster asterisks at arm's length. So you never wanna run dry in a dry climate. That's pretty obvious. But again, those three variables, temperature, barometric pressure, humidity, can negatively impact not only RSI, but the function of all body systems. That is a brilliant thing. I'm so glad we're talking about this. And I have a follow-up question, which is a lot of times when you're working in uh, with a lot of computers, the people keep the environment cold on purpose to, because the computers get overheated. So that seems kind of like a double whammy for the human body. And I'm not sure- It is absolutely. If you could, I'm sorry. Well, I was just thinking, I, it, I don't know if this is a fact, maybe you do, but maybe they also keep it dry. So that you'd be adding two variables that aren't good for you in one setting. Right, if you go back to the workhouses a century ago in the early 20th century, there were cold workrooms. And they thought that kept people awake a little better. And in fact, it does, you work better in a slightly cool environment. But if you look closely at some of the old black and white photographs, you'll see that they're wearing fingerless gloves. And so they're keeping their limbs as warm as possible given the environmental stress on tissue. It's amazing how these ideas of gloving and ergonomic ideas go out of fashion and then get rediscovered, you know, like that beautiful slant. Um, I have a photograph of a, a, a scribe and he's on this beautiful, it's almost like a drafting table, but the ergonomics are beautiful and you would love his pen hold. It's just beautiful. So um, I think this is really important for people to know that you know they should stay hydrated and warm enough. I don't know if there's an ideal temperature that you would wanna be working at. Do you know Dr. Markison? No, it really varies. Some like 68, some 66, some 70 highly variable and there should be consensus. Now that everybody's interwoven with the internet, they might as well uh, talk about some of these things that would take one minute of a corporate wide Zoom call to figure it out. But you mentioned scribes, the ancient scribes of Egypt were the first to describe repetitive strain injury. And they did it in hieroglyphics, explaining the stress involved in hieroglyphic making. There were about 10 boys for every girl studying from age eight, eight or 10 till 18 or 20, and it was pretty pretty rough training, but believe me, those scribes 
described the perils of scribing. Fast forward to today, electronic health records and scribes. I know we're all sort of enchained with this interaction that um, a lot of people don't like. So there's one more thing that comes from Eastern thought. I know that it's true in Ayurveda. It's also true in Chinese medicine. And that's about drinking cold things. And the thought there is that it dampens your digestive fires. But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about drinking. They, they recommend that you drink hot water, which I actually do. Um, it's just nice, even on a hot day to drink hot water. And so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about drinking cold things or if it matters in your point of view. I think it does matter. I mean, the, the, the core temperature is variable, 98.6 up to 99, something like that. So the end point of all uh, thermal regulation in the body vis-a-vis -vis food and drink is to bring it to core temperature. That takes some metabolic energy to do. Since I'm somewhat obsessed with thought and function, and surgery obviously is the economy of thought and function. I don't like to stress with something very cold that has to become warm or something very warm that has to be cold. So I celebrate this moment with room temperature coffee. <laughs> we'll celebrate together. And um, I'm actually very happy to, to hear you say all this because I think it's, there's a lot of wisdom that we could incorporate into our lives by you know, not disturbing the, the natural functions. And, you know, people love ice cream, but I'll tell you something, it's considered poison in Ayurveda. And I can't remember the last time I've eaten ice cream for that reason. You know, it's just hard to digest. As you said, you got to go through all this energy to bring it up to the temperature of the, you know, 98.6 or whatever we are. Well, the interesting thing, if you, if you want to have something quote hot, it's synonymous with spicy. And as you know, uh, Asian peoples, uh, notably the Indians have a marvelous control over the, the levels of spice that they add. They're not necessarily superheating the food. In fact, they seldom do. But you go through levels in a curry, for example, and uh, you have the warmth and obviously that's generated by the, the graceful handling of spice, but it's not about thermal shock. And their, their spices are also medicinal. Uh, there's a high rate of diabetes in, in India. So a lot of the spices are geared toward controlling blood sugar and stuff like that. And I mean, I use spices medicinally myself. I rarely cook without them because of their healing properties. And it's fascinating to go into the, I have this big book on Ayurvedic herbs and it's really fascinating to learn about them and what they do. And I found them to be very effective. Feed is to look at the globe and look at hot zones and cold zones. Hot zones of disease are high prevalence of disease. 27% of, of people in Mexico and South America are suffering prediabetes or diabetes. That's a hot zone for that diagnosis. Cold zones, they have virtually no or minimal disease. And so you have to then study diet apart from other lifestyle issues and figure out who's eating what, why, and what, how does it relate to longevity? So the world's cuisine and a little tour, knowing, for example, you don't doubt the uh, wisdom of the ancient Indians, Chinese, and so on, why they do what they do to American food and these other natural anti-inflammatory herbs and spices. So it's a very worthy study. If you just cook the same cuisine for a lifetime, you're missing not only the fun, but the health. That is fascinating. I had no idea that there were hot and cold zones um, and that there was any correlation between that and disease prevalence. That is just fascinating. Well, we, go, we were going back to Hippocrates, you know, in the fifth and fourth century BC, where he said, food is fuel, food is medicine. But yeah, thinking of food as fuel or medicine and both medicine is a really great approach to planning your, your diet and your meals. So thank you so much, Dr. Markison. This is really, really interesting. I can't wait to get this episode out. Thank you. Thank you.